So without any further delay, please welcome the wise and gracious Scott Hershevitz. Scott, welcome to In Search of Wisdom. I'm excited to be here. Thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure. I've been looking forward to it. Today, we're going to be talking about your new book, Nasty, Brutish, and Short, Adventures in Philosophy with My Kids. Really enjoyed the book as a dad with a, a couple young kids myself. It was, it was great. So I'm curious to ask, what do your kids think about the book? You know, they've gone through different phases with it. They were super excited when I first had the idea and they used to squabble over who was going to be in more stories. And and they're still pretty jazzed, actually, you know, that the book exists and to get out in the world and talk to people they love signing books. But, you know, as we approach adolescence, they're starting to, you know, quibble with <laughs> with some with some of the details. Maybe they remember stories differently than I do or think I should have told them differently. So they, they've got more opinions now than they used to. <laughs> Nice. Well, I, I listened to it on on Audible, and I thought you did a great job with the with the narration. What they think of of your imitation of of voices and things like that? You know, they haven't heard the audiobook version, so you know, you know, like everybody, I think I, I don't love my voice, so I haven't I haven't listened to the audiobook, but I'm glad to hear that it worked well. Yeah, it it definitely did. So I guess to begin something you suggest in in the book kids are good philosophers so why are kids good philosophers i think there are two reasons that kids make really good philosophers the first is they're just new to the world and they're constantly confused by it so they're asking questions and they're questioning everything like they don't yet know what the standard explanations of things are they don't know what adults take for granted so i think just like being in the world and perplexed by things helps them see what's puzzling and the second reason I think make, they make good philosophers is that they're, they're not afraid of sounding silly when they ask questions. They're not afraid of getting things wrong when they try to answer questions, right? Silly, as I like to say, is kind of the business that kids are in. So, <laughs> so they're just willing to put their ideas out there and to make arguments. And I think both of those things give them advantages over lots of adults, that they're willing to ask questions and willing to try ideas out. Well, let me stay with that that theme of of being silly, I guess, if you will. I love something that you write in the book. You you talk about taking the the business of being an uncle, you know, as serious as you do as as a parent, which is not too serious. And you, you tell the story of a conversation with your your nephew and and talking about the number six and all of this stuff. How do we not take some of these important topics on? one hand with a, a little bit of silliness or not, you know, so serious. So I think, you know, so that conversation with my nephew, Ben, happened before I was a father. And I kind of reveled in the role of uncle. Like, I'm not responsible for these kids. I just get to be goofy with them. And so one day when this little guy was four years old, I said, hey, Ben, how do you, can you count to 10? And he started one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And I said, stop, stop. What did you just say? He said, seven. I said, no, before that. And he said, six. And I said, what's six? He told me it's a number. I said, no, it's not. I've never heard of six. I've been counting for years. And then I showed him when he counted 10, it's one, two, three, four, five, seven, eight, nine, ten. And he and I just started to have a fierce argument about this. And then once he saw that I wasn't backing down, he went to his mother and he said, you know, Uncle Scott said the number six doesn't exist. And to her great credit, her response was, well, Uncle Scott is very good at math. And, and so that was my, you know, attempt to, to like mess with the guy a little bit and confuse him. And, and, he, and I was impressed that he stuck to his guns. And eventually, you know, I let him in on the joke and we agreed that the number six exists. And in the book, you know, I say this, like, this is kind of a serious issue, right, that's embedded here. It's hard to say what the number six is and how it is that we know that the number six exists. Why do we go from five to six rather than from five to seven? And it's an invitation to think about what numbers are, which is a conversation that philosophers have been having for hundreds or thousands of years, just trying to wrap our heads. And they're really radically different views about whether numbers are thing that act, things that actually exist in the world independently of us or whether numbers are a thing that you made up. 
And I think like those deep issues, they're lurking just below the surface of everyday life. And that can kind of come out in fun ways in conversations with kids. If you just, you know, take up their attitude towards the world and pretend, pretend things are different than they are for a little bit. I, I love it. It, it. it reminds me of something I, I probably read a, a year ago, but it stuck with me a bit. William James was saying that, you know, we should always practice philosophy with a smile. Should be a joy to it. Why do you think we can get to that other side? I mean, there's lots of famous pessimistic philosophers and things like that. How do we keep keep a smile? So I don't know if philosophy should always be done with a smile. I think, yeah. you know, some issues are are hard and like affect us in profound and often sad ways. So I've been thinking lately in a in relation to a class I'm preparing, which is about questions of life and death and love. And some of those, you know, issues are going to be hard to talk about with a smile. But I think that I think of philosophy as in large part play with ideas. Right. And, you know, and playing with ideas is fun, just like playing mm -hmm. of any sort is fun. So, you know, a question that's asked in the language chapter in the book is why are some words bad? Right. Like, why do we just accept the idea that there's some strings of sound that we shouldn't say? That was something that bothered me as a kid. And I had a ton of fun writing that chapter like, you know, looking to linguists and seeing what they have to say about why words are bad and then having conversations with my kid trying to sort out, well, when is it okay to swear and when is it not okay to swear and, and coming away with the view, actually, that swearing yeah. can be good. That, like, I want my kids to be good at swearing. I just want them to know when the time and the place is. So, you know, I, I don't think philosophy always should be done with a smile, but I think so much of it is just fun and funny and should be enjoyed mm -hmm. that way. How about, you know, in terms of topics, was there a particular topic that was really fun for your kids to explore? So Rex and I for years would return to this question he first asked when he was four years old. Just one night at dinner, he said, I wonder if I'm dreaming my entire life. And, you know, we had a good conversation about that right then. I said, well, where do you, th where do you think you are if you're dreaming? He said, I think maybe I'm still in mommy's belly, which didn't seem like the most plausible form of dream skepticism as he would later allow. It wasn't clear how he would dream speaking if he didn't yet learn to speak. But I told him a little bit about Descartes and Descartes' worries that maybe he was dreaming everything that he thought was happening to him. And Rex got really absorbed in that. And he would return to it over and over again for years just, you know, kind of random moments, he would pop out with an idea of, you know, he, he would try, like, what he liked to try and do was prove that he wasn't dreaming, right? So he would try and, like, you know, imagine, like, different things that might test it or things that could happen in real, in, in, in his view, in the real world and not in a dream. So that was really, that was really fun for him, something that he got really engaged in. My little one, Hank, has gotten engaged. He comes back sometimes to a question that's taken up in the book, whether there's objective truth, whether, you know, we each get our own truth about things, which is an idea he finds himself attracted to, or or whether there are truths that we all share. We've had we've had arguments over that running for years. You explore all of these important questions, even the question of, of God. I remember, you know, being young, having questions and curiosity about that. And it was at least to me, at the time, it was perceived as an, maybe an inappropriate type of question to, to bring up. How can we explore some of these, you know, even if it's a complicated question like the one you were just referring to, or questions of God, how can we maybe as parents get more comfortable, you know, exploring and, and allowing space for that? Yes, this is a really great question. I was having a conversation several weeks ago with a friend of mine who is more religious than I am, and he talks to his kids about all sorts of things, but he kind of puts sort of challenging the existence of God, you know, beyond where he's willing to go in a conversation. And, and I understand why it feels that way to him, but I think, as you said, you had these questions when you were young, and I think every kid has quest these questions when they're young. And I think it's worth communicating to your kids that there's there's nothing that we can't think about and that we can't entertain and that we can't and question. 
And and actually, you know, one way in which I've approached it with my kids is when a big question comes up, like, does God exist? I don't want to tell them what my view is in a way that communicates, you have to hold my view. So I'll start by questioning them, right? And say, um, well, what do you think, right? Do you think God exists? And and they often are asking these questions because they've been wrestling about it and they've been thinking about it. And so they already have some views and they're actually looking maybe sometimes to share what their view is or what their idea is. And I think it's really great to find that out. Even if you want to, as my friend, wanted to nudge his kids in a certain direction, I think finding out what they're thinking rather than forcing them to suppress it is, is I think, worth doing. And it can lead to really surprising places. So I think maybe the most profound conversation I've ever had with one of my kids is reported in the chapter on God, where, again, it was Rex around the time he was four years old, asked if God was real. And I said, well, what do you think? And he said, I think that for real, God is pretend. And for pretend, God is real. And I was just kind of stunned by that. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, God's not real, but when we pretend he is. And I've been thinking about that. He's 12 now. I've been thinking about that ever since he said it. And uh, I even talked to my rabbi about it because I think it really helped me understand myself better, that conversation with Rex, because I don't think of myself as, as a believer in God. And nevertheless, Lots of religious practices are very important to me. I'm Jewish, and I celebrate various holidays, and I go to synagogue, and my son is studying for his bar mitzvah, and all of this is an important part of my life. And I've sometimes wondered, why is all this important to me if I don't actually believe that the stories we tell are true and that God exists? And Rex helped me understand that that God can be real when you pretend in the way that lots of things can be real when you pretend. And I can see that there's lots of value added to my life by pretending in a way that lets me participate in these traditions and rituals and gives me a community and a kind of structure for many things in my life. So so part of my pitch, actually, for thinking philosophically with your kids is they, they may say things that will, that will illuminate your world, that will, will help you understand things in a more deeper way. That's beautiful. And I love how you, you, I made a note of something you say towards the end of the book of, of something along the lines of seeing these conversations on an equal playing field, like a conversation with, with a peer, with an open mind of, of something that you can learn and someone that has, has wisdom to, to share. Yeah, there was a, a philosopher named Gareth Matthews who di- died more than a decade ago, I think. He, but he, he spent most of his career in conversation with kids. He was sort of struck in the same way I was by conversations that he had with his own children. And then he wondered, well, wait a minute, is this just kind of a general thing about kids? And so he started to talk to other parents. and He started to visit schools and discovered, yes, actually, kids are interested in philosophical questions. They raise them on their own. And Matthews really wanted to say that when you do philosophy with kids, you have this really unique opportunity to approach the conversation on equal terms. If you're teaching your kid science or math, there's no question that you're going to know better than they do. But if you're engaging a question like, does God exist, right? You can see that you're not really in a much better position to know the answer to this question than your kid is. Or if you're asking the question like, Am I dreaming my entire life? Could I be wrong about everything I think I believe? You're, again, not in a much different position than your kid is. And and Matthews thought actually these conversations could be collaborative because adults and kids would bring different things to them, right? Kids would be creative and asking questions about things that grownups wouldn't think to challenge. And grownups would be a little bit more disciplined in their thinking and rigorous and think about the different possibilities. So he thought there was a really unique opportunity here to work on the problem together rather than be in this didactic role where you're teaching your kids something. How did you come to have this this view or belief and, you know, see your role as a parent in, in this way? It seems like so many of us maybe can view our, our role as a parent of, of someone to provide knowledge, provide wisdom and more more doing than than receiving. Was there any sort of light bulb moment or an insight that that might come to mind? So. You know, I think it happens slowly over time, which is to say, not long after my kids started talking, I realized that they were saying things that were 
philosophically interesting, even if they didn't yet see it themselves, or they were doing things that raised questions in philosophy. And I started to incorporate them into my classes. So I'm a philosopher of law. If I was teaching a class about punishment, instead of starting with a legal case or a piece of philosophy that we read, I might say, hey, let me tell you this thing that my kid did. And and then ask my class, well, what do you, how do you think we should respond? How do you think we should have responded when the kid did this? And my class would come alive. People love to talk about kids and the crazy things they do. And it was then like an entry point into we're having a conversation in my classroom about the purposes of punishment without having yet turned to thinking about law or thinking about philosophy. And, and, and it was fun and enlightening and helpful there. And I think it just got me into thinking about my kids as a kind of rich source of philosophical material. But I think it also maybe just helps that I'm a law professor and I teach by asking questions. So I just came mm -hmm. to sort of naturally do that with my kids and was over and over again struck by how interesting their answers were. Well, I'm interested in, in their answers. I'm going to have to ask you, Scott, to maybe channel Hank and, and Rex here for a moment. We ask most guests on the show this is in search of wisdom and we generally do some sort of question around you know how do you think about or define wisdom in daily life mm -hmm. you know does anything how how might hank and rex respond to that if you put it to them you think oh that's a really good that's a really good question you know our relationship in respect to philosophy is changing a little bit because now they're on to me so if i try mm -hmm. if i if i went to them now and i said hey what do you think wisdom is hank would say are you going to put this in a book <laughs> <laughs> so see we we'd have to come at it obliquely i discovered i got the guardian the paper in london they they gathered questions philosophy questions from kids and gave me a chance to answer them in the paper and i got rex and hank's help so if i told them oh there's this kid that wonders what wisdom nice. is then they then they might then they might try it out with me i'm not sure i'm not quite sure what they'd say i think here, here's what i would want them eventually to come to say can i can i give you that as an answer sounds great yeah i think what i would want them the way i'd want them to come to think of it is that is that to have wisdom is to constantly be questioning to wondering to, to wonder about ways you might be wrong or, or what you might not have noticed yet. It's sort of the opposite of having certainty in a way. It's to think of yourself as a, as a perpetual student of the world, strug mm -hmm. struggling to make sense of it and realizing that you, you probably have it wrong. I've, I've thrown the question to my, my oldest, my, my daughter, who, who just turned 10, not, not recently, but maybe over the last couple of years. And she just mostly laughs and, and a little bit and tells me she's going to get back to me. But uh, well, it's your job to search for it, right? You know, you've got the, you've yeah. got the podcast, yeah. Yeah, the, but I sometimes wonder, like in my experience of it, observing my kids and some of these questions, and maybe how it differs from asking this question to you know guests that I have on the show or you know people my age. It's like there's a creativity there. But it seems like with my kids and, and even some of the responses from your kids, it's there's a simplicity as well. There's some sort of like creativity and simplicity. It's like it doesn't – there's not an overthinking type of thing. Like maybe the response when my daughter does come back to me, you know, it might not be like a long, you know, couple paragraphs or anything. It might be pared down to something simple. Yeah, I think that I don't want people to get a mistaken impression of what it's like to talk to your kids about philosophical questions, right? I say in the book that you shouldn't imagine that when Rex and I discuss the existence of God, that we're sitting by the fire and sipping brandy and, you know, these conversations extend <laughs> over the course of an evening. You know, they're often really quick, you know, you know, like, I, I think that whole conversation where he said that for real, God is pretend, and for pretend, God is real. God is real. It probably lasted three or four minutes, and then he was on to something else because that's how yeah. kids are. But you can come back to these conversations, you know, over again, and they can become, you know, deeper over time. I like to raise the things that I thought were interesting, or the or the questions I thought they asked that we could have talked about more. I raise them when they're in the bath or at bedtime, times when they're not focused on other things. But but you're right. Part of what's beautiful about these conversations with kids is often the stark simplicity with which they state their ideas or ask questions. So there's a story that I love to tell, which is in the introduction to the book that, that Gareth Matthews heard from the mother of a little boy named Ian. 
his family had friends over and there were three kids in that family. And when it was time to watch TV, those kids picked what, picked what to watch and Ian missed his favorite show. And at the end of the evening, after they went home, he said to his mother, why is it better for three people to be selfish than for one? <laughs> and it's such a simple question, He's, but it's so subversive. He's challenging something that grownups take for granted that if more people want one option than the other option, well, then you go, you go with making more people happy. But I think Ian, Ian's inviting us to rethink that in a really interesting way. And, and he's able to do that because he hasn't become acculturated to majority rule. And he doesn't take it for granted that when, you know, we disagree, we vote. So, so I, th I think that's part of the advantage children have in this exercise is sometimes the simplicity of their thought. It's interesting and it, it's really fun. I have a note to, to ask about, you know, what you learned about the virtue of justice and, and things like rights and, and revenge because kids naturally have the idea of fairness, you know, at a, at a very young age, it seems. Yeah, so I was really struck. I teach tort law at, at Michigan. And, you know, so I think a lot about the way we respond to wrongdoing. And some people argue that tort is a kind of substitute for revenge. And so I was really struck by how natural revenge seemed to my children. And I tell a story in the book of one, one morning, I'm hanging out with Hank. And he tells me that a kid at school called him a name, called him a floofer doofer. And then he says, and the teacher came to talk to me. I said, well, did she talk to the other kid? And he said, no, she just talked to me. And it was a little like pulling the study, like cross-examine him to get the story out. But it became clear that though he wouldn't tell me what he had done, that he had taken some sort of revenge on the kid that had called him a floofer doofer. And I said to him, Hank, did you think it was okay to do something mean to that kid because he said something mean to you? And he looked at me like I was stupid. And he said, yes, he <laughs> called me a floofer doofer. And... You know, it really got me thinking, just what is it about revenge that strikes him so, uh, that strikes him as just the obvious response when somebody says or does something mean to you? And I think there are like, actually multiple answers to that question. I think one reason kids are disposed towards revenge, maybe all people are disposed towards revenge, is you're, you're trying to deter people from treating you this way. You, you want to signal that, like, there are costs involved for you. So don't think you can get away with this. But I don't think it's just that. I think it's, I think that really what's motivating for Hank in that situation is his social standing. He doesn't want to be the kind of kid that, that you, you can call a floofer doofer or even just like the kind of kid who is a floofer doofer, whatever <laughs> that is. And so in that moment, when he decides to strike back, it's a way of protesting the treatment saying, hey, you shouldn't treat me that way. And this connects up with a very long tradition of philosophy about seeing resentment and, and seeing revenge as, as a kind of protest of mistreatment, of marking out, hey, I'm not of that low status that you can treat, treat this way. And what I think is helpful about recognizing that is that you can end that, then ask, well, if that's what people are interested in when they take revenge, it's kind of defending their social status, are there other ways we can do that for them? And so that's what I explore in the book is I think the answer is yes, both for our children and for grownups, there are good substitutes for revenge. Kids are so funny. I, as you're explaining that, I have to share this funny story about my, my youngest son who's getting ready to turn four. And uh, it applies to this, you know, he had an issue of, of fairness in terms of social standing with our, with our dog. We, we moved to this place about a year ago it's got a big backyard, trees and stuff, and we're in the backyard, and our dog Nacho, you know, goes number two in the in the backyard, and not paying much attention to it. A couple minutes later, I see my young son squatted down, getting ready to do the same. Yeah. So I'm I'm obviously whoa, wait, hold on, you 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 can't do that, and he just quickly replied, not happy about it. That's not fair. Yeah. You know, Nacho doesn't. And we had this discussion later about, you know, why. And he had a real good argument of why that should be okay. If, if Nacho is able to do that, it's fair that I am also able to do that. So super funny. Yeah. You know, that's not fair is like the kids all purpose 
Proton. And, you know, I'm sure there are moral psychologists who study this. You know, it's an interesting question, like why that's the first moral concept they latch on to. But this sort of like comparative notion of fairness, if he can do it, then I can do it, is a lot of what a parent deals with in the early days. And of course, right, those arguments are compelling when, you know, when the creatures are similarly situated. And and I'm sure you had some conversations about the the way in which your son differed, differed from Nacho. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's good stuff. Well, let me ask, as as listeners that are out there that are that are parents and they they have they're raising these these good philosophers, what comes to mind if you could think of maybe one or two strategies or, or takeaways for for listeners to keep in mind to help maybe cultivate their kids to be these good philosophers? So I think I'll give I'll give you two strategies. One is. I think that it's really important. I, I mentioned earlier, sort of like tossing these questions back at your kids, but I think like asking your kids questions and then questioning their answers is a really helpful way of getting them to think more deeply because often you just get a quick answer back. And, you know, I say in the book that like Americans like to say they're entitled to their opinion. And, and that's true in the sense that like nobody can beat it out of you. But it's not true in our house in a different sense, which is to say, like, you make a claim, you better be prepared to defend the claim. And my kids know that, that I'm going to ask you, why do you think so? And and push back, challenge it, look for ways that you might be wrong. And so I think, like, getting kids in the habit of considering objections to their views and making arguments in support of their views is a way to help them develop as thinkers. The second thing for people with, especially people with young kids, you know, your kids may spontaneously raise questions in philosophy. I think most kids do, and, and a lot of adults just miss them. Sometimes they're doing it implicitly, right? When your son says, hey, if Nacho can do that, I can too, he is making a moral claim, right? And you noticed, right? And thought, oh, like, I'm going to have a conversation about what fairness mm-hmm. consists in here. So that's great if your kid raises these questions on their own, but you don't have to wait for them to raise philosophical questions. One of my favorite resources is a website called Teaching Children Philosophy. If you just Google those words, Teaching Children Philosophy, you'll find this website. It's run by the Prindle Institute for Ethics, and it's got a set of like teaching modules for lots of common picture books, picture books that are probably already in your house if you have little kids, like Nuffle Bunny and and the Pigeon Books and Frederick and just lots of the books that, that populate people's homes. And it does two things. There's a kind of like like one paragraph. It's not it's not big, it's not scary. It'd be like one paragraph for parents about what kinds of philosophical issues are raised in that book. It'll give you a little bit of background, but then the most helpful thing it has is a list of questions you can ask your kids while you're reading. So I mentioned this book, Frederick. It's one of my favorite books, or was one of my favorite books to read with my kids when they were younger. It's about the group of mice who are getting ready for the winter. And some of the mice, most of the mice are collecting food, but Frederick is, you know, sitting, he doesn't seem to be doing anything. And the mice say, hey, Frederick, what are you doing? And he says, I'm collecting colors and I'm collecting words. And then winter comes and the mice start to run low on food. And they say, hey, Frederick, where are you supply? Where are your supplies? And he stands up and he recites a poem. And as the story tells it, he makes them feel warmer and he entertains them. He makes their lives a little bit less bleak. And it's this really wonderful story that raises so many questions that you can ask kids like, was it fair of Frederick to be writing a poem when the other mice were gathering food? Is What's the value of a poem? Is the value of a poem the same as food? How do, how do poems contribute to our lives? Is poems more or less important than food? And so you're just, you can have this conversations about morality and a conversation about aesthetics just by asking some really simple questions as you go along. And this, this, this a website, Teaching Children Philosophy, is just full of lots of suggestions for how to do this when you're reading books. And we didn't do it every night, but especially when you have read the same story as you tend to do when you've got little kids over and over and over again. And and you're dreading as a parent having to read this book for the 15th time, hop on this website and see if there's an interesting question or two that you can ask as you read the story. I love that. I greatly appreciate the resource. I'll link that in the in the show notes so listeners can easily get to it. And you highlight something in the book that around knowledge, you, you don't need to have any knowledge, you know, to particularly explore some of these these big topics. Could you say more there? 
Sure. You know, I think that sometimes people are afraid to have conversations because they don't know the answers. And and I think, again, just sort of like calling back to the the conversation we had earlier about the possibility that philosophy can be a collaborative conversation with your kid. So, you know, one day my kid thought that he had come up with an argument. He was in second grade all on his own that the universe was infinite. And, you know, I don't know if the universe is infinite, but he made his argument. It was like, he's like, if I take a spaceship all the way to the end of the universe and I'm, and I'm standing right there and I punch my hand forward, right? It's got to go somewhere. And I was like, well, what if it doesn't? And he said, well, then there's something stopping it. So you're not at the edge yet. And we had a super cool conversation about this. And I, and I checked later, right? I have, you know, teach with philosophers. So I have a friend who's a philosopher, a physicist. I say, hey, let me tell you about this argument my kid made. And he helped me understand, like, both that this argument has a long history. There was an ancient Greek philosopher named Architas who made this argument, and it was accepted through hundreds or thousands of years. Now scientists know it's wrong, and he explained that why, why this argument doesn't quite work. But I didn't need to know any of that to have this super cool conversation with my kid and to wonder with him together, is there a way to figure out if the universe goes on forever? So, you know, you can always do research later, but don't let the fact that you don't know much stop you from having the conversation. And also, you probably know more than you think you do, right? You know, mm-hmm. like, you probably have a view about what the value of poetry is, or you'll come up with a view in the course of a conversation with your kid. Do you ever do, you know, maybe a Google search later or something with them? I I think of some of these questions around God and, and, and things like that. And some of these big questions, you know, they've, they've been pondered for thousands of years, at least looking up, not nothing deep, but this person says this, this person, you know, says this, because it seems like it could get frustrating. Of, it's like there's a hunger for sure what might be the possible answers. Well, and my hope actually is, you know, like this is partly a book that is is about kids and is maybe encouraging parents to have these kinds of philosophical conversations with their kids. But as I, as I say up front, I really want to capture the adults' minds, not kids' minds. Like, Mm -hmm. kids are kind of my Trojan horse. They make this funny and fun. But I think it'd be great, and I do it all the time, of, like, some some, kid has said something really interesting, and I don't know a lot about that topic. Let me look around a little bit. And so I'll give you a couple more resources. One is wireless philosophy, or Wi-Fi is, but P-H-I, is a series of videos on YouTube that are done by professional philosophers, but they're like five or six minute introductions to topics and they're cleverly animated. And and Rex and I watch many of them together, right? So if he asks me a question and I don't know anything about it, we'll go look and see if there's a video that we could watch. Or sometimes even if I do, I know those are going to be kind of like a bite-sized explanation that we could watch together and then talk about it a little bit more. So that's one resource. As, as a grown-up, if you get more seriously interested in things, the one of the best resources available is the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, which is free online. All the entries are written by experts. Some are more dense and difficult than others, but usually just even the opening few paragraphs will provide you a basic overview, and then you can go as in depth as you like. And then they also have a bibliography at the end that suggests articles and books to read and sometimes in resources that are freely available on the internet. So when I want to do a deep dive and really understand a topic, that's where I go. Let me ask an, another question, maybe connected to resources and adults getting interested in, in philosophy and stuff like that. It seems like when it comes to parenting, if we're looking for advice, we look specifically to you know, a book on, on parenting. If it's leadership, we're looking for a book specifically on leadership. You know, would you say that any good philosophy book is, is also a bit of a parenting book, a a bit of a leadership book? Does philosophy, you know, how, how broad is it? Any thoughts there? So I think there's philosophy about everything. There's actually, it was a joke that got cut out of the introduction to this book. You know, I don't know if you've ever heard people on the internet talk about rule 34, which is if it exists, then there's porn about it. It is like, you know, it was like an early joke on the internet. And I hope that's not true, actually. But, but, I, but I do believe that the analogous claim about philosophy is true. If it exists, there's philosophy about it. And so there is philosophy about leadership and there is philosophy about parenting and there's philosophy about love and death and 
computers, and you, you name it. There are philosophers historically that have worried about it, and there are philosophers that are worrying about it now. And actually, one of the reasons I wrote Nasty Bruce and Short is I wanted people to see that philosophy is not this dead thing that was done by these, you know, people hundreds of years ago that you, you know, heard about in college, but rather is this active enterprise that people are out in the world writing really super cool things about problems that are relevant to your life. So like the book includes a discussion of Angela Schneider, who was an Olympic silver medalist, who then became a philosopher of sports and writes about gender equity in sports, among other topics. And, you know, so when we have conversations about, say, what the eligibility criteria should be for women's sports, whether trans athletes should be eligible to participate, there, this is really cool resource, right, that we can go to philosophers who are also amazing athletes who have thought a lot about gender equality and the points of point of segregating men's and women's sports. And so, you know, I guess part of what I want to say is, is, is philosophy is really as broad as could be. And whatever it is you're wondering about in the world, there's probably some super cool philosophy about it. Well, I love it. You did a great job with the book. I really enjoyed it. Again, for the listeners, it's Nasty, Brutish, and Short, Adventures in Philosophy with My Kids. Where would you point listeners interested in learning more about you and, and your work in the world, Scott? So I've got a website. It's just scotthershevitz.com. And, you know, you can check it out there and then you can find the book. And the book is actually a really great guide to, to what I do and what I'm interested in. But, but it's, you know, just by way of, you know, I, I think of myself as an evangelist for philosophy. Talk to your kids about philosophy. Talk to your friends about philosophy. It'll sort of deepen your life and you'll have fun doing it. So I'd encourage people more than visiting my website to just track down a copy of the book wherever, wherever you buy books. Awesome. Well, Scott, thank you so much for coming on In Search of Wisdom. This is a blast. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you so much for listening. You can get the show notes and links to resources mentioned at perennialleader.com slash podcast.